Okay. Um, I'm an academic clinical psychologist uh, based at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, but today, as Steve said, we have um, speakers from Edinburgh, from Glasgow, and from Telegarden. So hopefully, it will be a very nice evening tonight. Um, so perhaps we should start introducing our first speaker. So I'm uh, Andrew McIntosh. I'm a professor of biological psychiatry at the University of Edinburgh. And uh, what that means is I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, that's my day job. I'm medically qualified and a specialist in the treatment of people with mental illness. Now, uh, most of my work is actually researching the causes of mental illness. So um, the, the clinical part of my job is treating people mostly with mood disorders, mostly with uh, depression and something called manic depression, which I think most people will have heard of in the audience. And I, I'm really interested in what causes these, uh, what causes these problems in clinics because um, the treatments that we use in the clinic are, though they are, though they are effective, there's about 40% or, or so of people who have depression that don't respond fully to their treatments. So I'm, I'm fundamentally interested in, in why that is and in finding out which, which sorts of treatments that people respond to. So I'm interested in the fact that some people with depression seems to re seem to respond very well to medical treatments, to antidepressants. Some people don't, and other people seem to find a treatment with a talking treatment with a psychotherapy better. And so I'm interested in the complexity of depression and in dividing people up into the different causes and uh, and understanding wh why the illness develops in some people and not others. So. Um, this event itself is, is uh, about depression, but it's also about resilience. So I, I thought I'd set the scene, first of all, by, by saying uh, what, what I think resilience is. And um, I'll start off by talking about depression by saying, if, if I was to imagine taking the audience here and, and uh, let's, let's, all, let's, take you to, let's do the experiment of taking you all to Syria for today and uh, leaving you in a war-torn district where you were under threat of, uh, you know, constant threat to your life. Um, you didn't have food or eating. You maybe didn't know uh, food or, or drink, regular water. You maybe were living in really unpleasant circumstances. Uh, you maybe didn't know what would happen to your relatives, and uh, you were really living in the most unbearable stress. Now, uh, in those circumstances, you might expect that you'd feel depressed. In fact, up to about 50% of people in those sorts of circumstances do feel depressed. And that's, that's not really unexpected. Everybody in the audience can probably imagine why that would be. And that, that is, is, is one way that we think of depression, that maybe people who are exposed to very stressful life events and have depression, maybe they're a distinct kind of depression. Maybe those people might respond, say, for example, better to psychotherapies and, and better to uh, resolution of war and uh, governmental interventions. Um, but resilience isn't about the people who develop depression when you'd expect them to. It's more about the people who don't develop depression when you might expect them to. So if I was to heap awful things in your life on you, if you were to have many stressful life events, really live in awful circumstances, then it's not, in, not so much interesting in a biological sense as to why you become depressed. It's, it, it's kind of fascinating why some people don't become depressed when you might expect them to. And so that, that's the way I think about resilience, and it's the way I, I, we, we thought about resilience when we've done some of our work in Edinburgh. Um, so the definition of resilience that people often use is to say it's a better than expected adjustment. So it's when you're doing better than the circumstances would perhaps lead people to think that you might. So I've drawn it up in this little, uh, little diagram here that if you imagine the right-hand column and you were to develop depression when you'd not had any stress in your life, then that, that's not, that, that, so if you develop depression, if you don't develop depression when you've not had any stress in your life, then that's not unexpected. You, you, you don't expect many people to develop depression when they don't have any stress in their life. But there are, there are some people who do. There are some people that seem to have um, a very, um, so sometimes this runs in families, and depression seems to come for no reason at all. It seems to arise in, in some individuals when there seems to be no reason, uh, no stress, and it used to be thought that that was a, a, some form of a genetic disorder that ran in families. And it was called endogenous depression to signal that it came from within. And there are some people who are stressed and they get depression. And we call them you know, having a reactive depression. So you get depressed when you're stressed and we call that reactive. Um, and the people in the bottom left-hand corner are the people that are stressed and who don't become ill. 
and we think of those people as resilient. Now, I'd like, I'd like to have a show of hands now, if, if you don't mind. Uh, is there anybody in this room who hasn't had any stress in the last month? So, so uh, it's very, I mean, stress isn't something that's either present or absent. Of course, everybody's exposed to greater or lesser amounts of stress. So it's not a black or white situation. And so there's, there's more than one way of measuring it. And so one part of our interest here is in understanding and measuring resilience better. So we think that there are ways it could be measured better than it, than, than it is currently. So um, that's one of the things we're working to better understand. Um, maybe I could go on to the, the, the next slide. And um, so is there anything you want me to talk about, Stephen? Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think that you've just been funded to uh, an impressive extent by the Wellcome Trust to this program, it's called Straddle. I wonder if you could take us through that research approach. Sure. So, um, as, so as I said earlier, um, I'm a biological psychiatrist, so I'm really interested in kind of what happens at the level of genes and cells and, and, and that sort of thing. So what we decided to do was uh, to study resilience um, if you just looked at people at one point in time when you were either depressed or you weren't depressed, it would be very difficult to understand what had caused your depression. So we felt that you had to study people before they were depressed, find out what risk factors they'd been exposed to, and then find out what happened to them later on. And so by doing that, we thought that you could understand why people developed the illness and also understand why people didn't develop the illness. And so that was the, that's the aim of this study. So we based this around uh, a large Scottish uh, group of uh, individuals, so over 20,000 people, in a study, a previous study that was called Generation Scotland. And so uh, we have 20,000 people recruited from families. And so uh, I'm just going to go around this wheel, basically telling you a little bit about the study and what we hope to do. So um, by having a group of people who are largely well at the outset and being able to study them uh, forward over about 10 years, we hope to be able to find out why some people remain, remain well when we wouldn't necessarily expect them to. So why, is, why are some people resilient? And also, because we're looking at people who've developed depression over that time, we can go back and we can look and see what sort of stressful life events they've been exposed to, um, what sort of risk genes that they carry, what the causes uh, of, their, of their depression are. But I want to concentrate on a couple of things that are in this uh, slide. So, um, one of the terrific things about uh, Generation Scotland is that the people who were in the study have given their consent for us to trace them through their medical records. So we can look at people repeatedly over time uh, without the need to go back and administer a questionnaire, but just merely to go to the NHS records and find out you know, what it, what's happened to them over the next 10, 20, 30, maybe even longer than that. So. Um, and just going, we can ask them uh, when, we, when we meet them what sort of coping strategies they use. So one of the theories is that people might be resilient to depression because they have particular coping strategies. So just to give you an example of this, people that make lists at the beginning of their day and decide what they're going to do and tick off their list, might, there's a theory that they might cope better with stress than people that don't make lists. So I, I'll give you a minute to think about whether you're a list maker or not. Um, the other sorts of things that we're interested in are in genetic factors. So if we've got a group of people who are resilient and we've got a group of people who have developed depression, then we can compare them on a number of things. And the sorts of things we're interested in are genes and cells and brains, really. And I want to explain a little bit about why we're interested in that, because I think uh, we need to set the scene. So when, when I, um, so e every time I, I uh, see a patient in clinic, I'm usually administering a, a, a drug, an antidepressant to them, or I'm referring them for psychotherapy. But the, the sorts of drugs that we use, the, the way in which they uh, act on chemicals in the brain is, is understood somewhat. They act on certain chemicals that are transmitters between cells. So one nerve cell uh, joins onto another and the messages are transmitted through chem chemicals that are released uh, at the joint between them. It's called the synapse. So, and all of them operate on molecules. And the molecules are, are always, almost always proteins. And the way that body makes proteins is through genes. And so our, our contention is that if you can understand the genes that cause mental illness and cause people to be resilient, then we will eventually be able to understand how that affects the, 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 uh, the chemicals in the brain, how that affects how nerves communicate with one another, 
and how that, that, that the communication between nerve cells eventually leads people to behave differently or to be uh, more depressed than others. So that, that's the idea behind this. Um, because if we can get to that kind of fine molecular understanding of why people are depressed, we can treat their depression. But we can also think about ways in which we can kind of uh, bolster people's resilience. So this is not something that's been tried uh, in my field uh, very much in the past. M most of the research on resilience has actually been on, on in animal studies. But we're really interested in thinking about how it affects uh, the people who are at risk of depression, which is, because it's so common, is pretty much everybody. So we're interested in seeing if there are ways in which we could eventually help people to foster, to bo bolster their own abilities to fight off low mood and to fight off stress, uh, kind of fostering the body's own innate, innate responses by understanding it at, kind of at the level of the molecule and of the cell. So I, I don't think I want to show, um, I don't think I want to speak very much more. I probably don't have much time, but I just want to show you this, uh, this diagram here. So this diagram here is a sample taken from somebody with depression. And what's possible now is that you can take a sample of skin cells from somebody, and whereas you could never have done a brain biopsy of somebody with mental illness, that would have been you know, obviously unethical and not a good thing, you can now take samples of, samples of cells from people and grow them into brain cell-like tissues. So this gives us a window on what's happening on the brain in people with mental illness and in depression specifically. So sorry if I've overrun. No, that was very thorough. And we better watch our time. We're very keen on getting you to ask questions and engage in discussion towards the end. I'm going to uh, ask if anyone's got any burning questions right at the moment. If you can't wait until about 8 o'clock or, or so. If not, good, because that will help us keep the time. And thank you very much, Andrew, for giving us an introduction to depression and resilience.